plasma, you have to, to take into account distribution. So, this so let's um, give you a um, brief summary of useful formulas that we will um, employ. <coughs> Ah, I wanted to mention something. I don't have time to talk about uh, new, uh, neutrinos in supernovas, but in this uh, kind of uh, notes here that uh, have been linked uh, to the web page, in any case I mentioned, there is a chapter on uh, supernova neutrinos. It's a little bit concise, and if you are interested, I can give you uh, further literature uh, on that. Uh, so we have a distribution that in equilibrium is 1 over the exponential of p minus mu over t plus or minus 1 whether you're dealing with fermions or bosons. So just standard formula. Uh, this is uh, the chemical potential which is present if you have an asymmetry between the number of particles and the number of antiparticles. Uh, <coughs> For most of the lecture, mu is equal to zero, except when we will be talking about a lepton asymmetry. So if I integrate the distribution, I will get the number densities in equilibrium, and this will be different if I'm dealing with relativistic or non-relativistic particles. So if I have a relativistic particle, And let me get the, my pies right. So um, this will go simply as G T cubed. Now this G is not a coupling. This indicates the numbers of degrees of freedom that you have in the theory. So I mean, we have changed a little bit the perspective. And we're doing neutrino um, astroparticle physics. And instead, if you have a non-relativistic particle, Then you have, you have the number of degrees of freedom, and then you have an exponential of m over t. Uh, and then you have an additional term here in front, which is mt divided 2 pi to the 3 halves. I should also mention that we'll do many things order of magnitude. So many times I will forget pi's and twos uh, and just look at the dependence on temperature, etc. But the, what is important here is if I'm dealing with relativistic particles, the number density scales as t cubed. If I deal with non-relativistic particles, the equilibrium number density is exponentially suppressed. As I go to lower <coughs> temperatures, the suppression becomes more and more important very, very quickly. Ah, the other, uh, just a note, sometimes I will use it, uh, the entropy density, this scales also as a t cubed, and uh, particularly I have a 2 pi squared g star divided by 45, where g star is the number of relativistic degrees of freedom, so it's all different definitions, but usually is uh, numbers of order few or, hun or tens, depending on where I'm, uh, deal what I'm dealing with. So a key moment in uh, the kind of the evolution of a particle in the universe is when it goes from being in equilibrium and getting out of equilibrium or vice versa. So this is called freeze out. If uh, you do the converse, you call it freeze in. But the standard case is that you have a particle which has interactions. These interactions are sufficiently fast and they keep the particle in equilibrium with the rest of the plasma. At some point, these interactions <laughs> become too slow and uh, with respect to the expansion of the universe, and then these particles don't have time anymore to find another particle and interact. And therefore, you freeze whatever densities and properties of the particles you have. From that moment onwards, it's just, just the expansion of the universe and number density, etc., and um, redshift. So,
Let's talk about the coupling or freeze out. So generically, how do you keep particles in equilibrium in a thermal plasma? So you will have your particle of interest, let's say, for instance, a neutrino, and you will have interactions, for example, this, which could go in another type of particle, and in equilibrium, the two uh, interactions that, um, happen with the same rate. And so you will end up with an equilibrium distribution of psi and equilibrium distributions of phi. At some point, as I said, it could be that this cross-section for many times the scales, for example, with a t square or a t to the fourth. Now, in these cases, then as the temperature drops, the cross-section becomes uh, uh, lower, the interaction rate becomes lower, and therefore it's possible that you can have only one type, the interaction only in one direction, and the particle freezes out. Nothing else can happen. What is the condition which kind of quantifies when this happens is when the interaction rate is of the same order as the expansion rate of the universe. So gamma is the interaction rate. And this is given by the average cross-section multiplied by the density of the part. Average, because now you have a plasma, so you have to integrate over momentum, etc. Uh, instead, the H is the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, let me get my pies right. Uh, but okay. And this goes as a T square divided by M Planck, where M Planck is 1.2. 10 to the 19 GeV. <coughs> so you see, this increases with T squared, and that depends on what it does. Uh, but many times, or decreases as a t squared, if you want. Many times this goes as a much higher power of t, so decreases faster. At some point, the two match, and is when the particle freezes out. So the, this we can apply to neutrinos and see when the neutrinos decouple from the thermal plasma. So we can do that. What essentially we need to understand is uh, the cross-section for neutrinos in the early universe. So let's look at neutrino decoupling. So we said we need to apply this uh, relation where gamma is what? So what is the cross-section? So let's look at the processes which will be relevant. will be, for example, neutrino, neutrino, new alpha, new alpha, going into EE and back. Or neutral current interactions, new Q, new Q, new E, new E, both neutral current and charged current if I'm dealing with an electron neutrino, et cetera. So let's do an estimate of the cross-section. So can you do that? So first of all, what will be, I can tell you that we are at relatively low um, temperatures, and the temperature is related to the average energy around, uh, the average energy is around three times uh, the temperature. So we are well below 100 GeV temperatures. Indeed, we are in the MEV range. So what is the cross-section at these energies? So what is the coupling which is relevant? G Fermi, right? To which power? Squared, right? Now, there's only one kind of energy parameter that I have, which is the temperature for this plasma that kind of describes the energy of the neutrino uh, component of the plasma. So now, so I will need to have a T here and a T to which power? 
So this is the generic cross-section order of magnitude estimate for these interactions in the thermal plasma. Of course, you can do it a little bit more precisely um, I, using, I mean, the, looking at charge current, neutral current, etc. So what is now the interaction rate? This will go as GF squared, T squared, and then I need the number density. At MeV energies, neutrino masses can be neglected. These are highly relativistic particles, so the number density will scale as a T cube. Of course, I have lots of factors here, but all are all terms of order one. That if I do the, I, mean, I need to do the uh, computation precisely, but as an order of magnitude estimate is uh, um, perfectly fine. So now I need to equate gamma with H. So I have. Uh, uh, let me do it in a new page. <laughs> so now I take gamma to be of the same order of H, so I have a GF squared, T to the fifth, and this needs to be equal to T squared over M Planck. And then I obtain that the decoupling temperature for neutrino is around the cubic root of one over GF squared M Planck. So, um, you know order of magnitude, what is GF, kind of order of magnitude in GV? To the minus 5 squared is 10 to the minus 10, and Planck is 10 to the 19, so 10 to the 9. GF to the cubed, I take the square root, uh, the cubic root, and I get roughly 1 mV. I also know that, uh, for instance, Electron neutrinos, so first of all, what particles will you have in this thermal plasma at few MeV? What particles can you have? You will have neutrinos, of course, we're talking about their decoupling. What else will you have? Electrons, positrons, and photons. You cannot have muons because the mass of the muon is 100 MeV. The plasma doesn't have enough energy to keep the muons in equilibrium. They decouple below their mass. But, and of course you have quarks. Well, at this point uh, you have had already um, uh, the change of from quarks to nuclei. So, but they don't really uh, play big art much of a role here in the sense that I want to look at the difference between new E's and the new mu's and tau's. Now new E's will have charge current interactions with the plasma because they can interact with electrons while muons and tau's cannot have charge current interactions because there's no muons and tau's in the plasma. So what will happen is that the uh, cross-section for new E's is slightly bigger than from new mu's and tau's because of the charge current component. Now if the cross-section is higher, it means that the particles will stay a little bit longer in equilibrium and the decoupling temperature will be lower. So if you do this precisely, which I suggest actually that you do as an exercise, you will find that the decoupling temperature of electron neutrinos is more around um, 1 MeV, while that of the muon and tau neutrinos is slightly high, around uh, 2 to 3 uh, MeV. Okay, so what do they do afterwards? Well, really not much. Uh, they redshift, but they are very, very uh, numerous. I mean, they have a number density which is T cubed. So, the first thing which happened immediately after neutrino decoupling is the fact that uh, you have that the electrons positron get out of equilibrium. So, let's talk about the temperature of neutrinos. So, 
at a fraction of an MeV, electron positrons get out of equilibrium. And so what do they do? They dump their entropy into the plasma. But what is the plasma at this point, which is uh, uh, coupled, is only the photons. So uh, the E and E plus uh, get out of equilibrium. and give their entropy to the photons, effectively raising their temperature. Well, the neutrinos do not partake in this entropy. And so what happens? That compared to the photons, which is what we use to define the temperature, neutrinos are colder because the photons have been heated up and the neutrinos have not. So I can use um, entropy conservation and then what I can find that the temperature of the neutrinos compared to that of the photons is a factor of 4 over 11 to the one third. And these are just the numbers which come from taking into account that the number of degrees of relativistic degrees of freedom are unchanged before and after um, electron positron um, uh, decoupling. Okay, so what happens afterwards? So let's make a kind of um, ideal timeline for the neutrinos. So at temperatures around 1 MeV, neutrino decouple, then here they, they kind of cool down with respect to the photons. Here we have E plus, E minus, freeze out. And then around in this region between 1 MeV and um, and KV, you have Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Now, Big Bang nucleosynthesis depends crucially on the balance between neutrons and protons that you have in the plasma. So, and this is when you go from nuclea, uh, nucleons to nuclei. So, um, at the QCD um, early on, around 400 MeV, you go from quarks uh, to nucleons, and now you go from nucleons to nuclei. Uh, and uh, so what controls uh, this uh, number of neutrons versus protons is reactions of this kind, beta decays, inverse beta decays, etc. And so this is the reason why Big Bang nucleosynthesis is used as a way to um, kind of test the number and the properties of neutrinos. Because, for example, if I have um, more kind of, uh, for example, chemical potential in electron neutrinos, so effectively I change the moment this reaction gets out of equilibrium, and therefore I change, I change the number density of neutrons. Uh, the other way, if I have more neutrinos, including, for instance, sterile neutrinos, again, I change uh, this, uh, um, uh, this freeze-out uh, for the neutrons. And therefore, I, I change the number of neutrons, neutrons I change uh, the, uh, um, uh, the predictions for helium, deuterium, etc. So it's a bit of a complicated uh, topic. If you are interested, I can discuss that in detail. But the only thing uh, kind of that I want to mention that this is one of the processes we use in the early universe to constrain neutrino properties, in particular the number of neutrinos. This is not the number of active neutrinos, this is the number of total, the total number of neutrinos. So any 
relativistic degree of freedom uh, will be counted here. And usually it's given in terms of number of fermionic degrees of freedom, and that's why they are called the number of neutrinos. Okay, so nothing much happens in between, then we arrive at the CMB. Here, the impact of neutrino is relevant, but somewhat uh, subdominant. Instead, I want, I want to talk about what happens later on uh, when the structure forms, so LSS, large scale structure. This is when perturbations in the density of dark matter grow under the gravitational potential and collapse into structures that we observe. Here a structure, you mean galaxies and cluster of galaxies. So we understand this process uh, quite well. So, neutrinos as hot dark matter. So, the basic idea is the following. So, just due to perturbations in the early universe, you will end up with a distribution of dark matter which is uneven with little perturbations, big, small, etc., etc. Now, if you wait long enough, and here I'm talking about Z, maybe 100 or so, these structures start to grow under the gravitational potential. Of course, the gravitational potential is higher where you have a higher density. And so what happens is that the dark matter falls into the potential wells corresponding to this overdensity. Now, that makes the overdensity more um, dense, and therefore you have, not more dense, um, bigger, and therefore you have a stronger gravitational well, and therefore more infall of matter. And in this way, you will enhance uh, very, very much these overdensities, which will be the seeds for the formation of uh, galaxies and structure, uh, and the clusters of galaxies. Now, following this problem, um, uh, perturbatively is very, very difficult, actually it's not possible. So the way this is done is by using um, cosmological simulations. So you have these um, big numerical codes like gadget or other uh, techniques which solve um, the, uh, essentially uh, the Newtonian potential and the motion of um, the uh, kind of representative particles of dark matter, um, which so when they talk about particles, what they mean is a huge, many, many solar masses of dark matter. They, fall their, uh, they follow the gravitation, the, the motion due to um, their um, intrinsic velocity and the Newtonian potential, and in this way, they follow the growth of this gravitational, uh, uh, over, uh, of this uh, density um, and the formation, of, as I said, of uh, structure. Now, what is the role of neutrinos into this? So neutrinos are much, much faster than dark matter, or normal dark matter. Cold dark matter, as the name says, is a part these uh, particles for which we can neglect their intrinsic velocity. So essentially they are non-relativistic when all this happens. Now neutrinos, although they might not be relativistic, uh, but they still be quite uh, fast compared to cold dark matter. Now, if a particle is sufficiently fast, it will not feel efficiently the gravitational potential. So what they do, if you have a certain amount of this density made of neutrinos, this component here will not feel the gravitational potential, but instead will travel over a certain scale. And uh, this, remember that you have a time uh, defined here, which is the, the, given by the um, uh, uh, Hubble constant, so by the um, expansion of the universe. So this defines you a certain time, therefore a certain scale. And over this scale, these neutrinos can travel and distribute their, their density over this uh, um, scale here. And so what will happen? The, de the growth of structure will be suppressed compared if you had only cold dark matter. So this is the net effect of hot dark matter, in particular neutrinos, on the growth of structure. 
you have less structure at uh, a certain scale and below than you would expect. So how do we quantify um, this, uh, the, these perturbations, how much structure we have at a certain scale? We go in uh, uh, the Fourier space and then we take the power spectrum. So the power spectrum for matter uh, as a function <laughs> of distance, of scale, and actually I'm looking at the inverse of the scale, which is given by this parameter, usually it's called k, which is the inverse of the distance, um, goes like this. So this is if you have cold dark matter. You, this, at a certain k, therefore at a certain distance, you will have a certain amount of power, so a certain amount of structures. This is what the, this power spectrum quantifies. If I have neutrinos, what it tells me is that for scales slow, smaller than this, I will have less power, I will have less structure, which corresponds to having less power. And so, in fact, you expect a suppression of the power spectrum. And by looking at this uh, very tiny effect, there's a few percent effect, uh, that this is the way we put now uh, constraints on neutrino masses from cosmology. So what you need to do is measure, well, I can uh, give you maybe a little bit more information. Indeed, in this suppression of the power at small scales goes as eight times omega nu over omega m. You know what omega is, right? It is the density, rho, the energy density, divided by the critical density. Is, this is from cosmology. Everybody has taken a cosmology course, I assume. Okay. And so, as I said, then, we, we need to measure this uh, power. So what we need to look is at the structures going through a space and reconstruct the power that I observe at each scale. And uh, so you need to observe the structures, and there are two ways to do that mainly. One is to look at the visible matter, and then you have to relate the visible matter to the dark matter. Uh, and you do that by using tracers, galaxies, for example. Uh, these are tracers of the visible matter that you see. So you have these um, very large surveys of uh, galaxies and uh, clusters of galaxies, and then uh, with that you reconstruct the power uh, and uh, the power spectrum uh, in this way. And the other way is to look directly at dark matter using lensing. So um, you all know what lensing is, gravitational lensing, right? So, uh, and using weak lensing in particular, you can reconstruct the distribution um, of uh, dark matter. And in this way, then again, you go in Fourier space and you reconstruct the power spectrum. Uh, right now, the bounds that you obtain, um, well, I, first of all, I need to relate the omega nu to neutrino masses and omega nu using the fact that you have, so what will this be? This is rho nu divided rho critical. And rho nu is what? These by now are non-relativistic particles. This will be the number density multiplied by the mass divided by rho critical. And the number density, you know because this is the T cube which has just redshifted up to now. So if I plug in numbers, what I obtain is the sum over neutrino masses divided by 93 EV and then H squared. And H is this parameter which gives you um, the value of the Hubble constant now. This from your con I assume you have all taken a cosmology course, otherwise I, I make a step back and we discuss these things as well. Okay, so if I had a, a 100 dV neutrino, I would end up with omega equal to 1, but indeed you know that uh, omega dark matter is 1.3, and omega hot dark matter needs to be much, much, much smaller than that. And so using this sub the observation on the suppression of the meta power spectrum, and then relating that to neutrino masses, what I find is constraints on neutrino masses, which, well, let's say right now, 0.12 eV or so. Uh, this is on the, the sum of the neutrinos. I, 
this depends very much on the um, data sets that I take. So the ways I constrain, as you can imagine, this power spectrum depends on lots and lots of things, lots of other cosmological parameters, uh, the dark matter density, the expansion of the universe, etc., etc., etc. So, and I will use other cosmological observations also to constrain those parameters as well. And then when I combine all together, I obtain different bounds. I would say. For me, I'm a little bit more conservative. I take uh, something around maybe 0.3 or something like that as a kind of a ballpark number to keep in my mind. Um, uh, new observations, which are coming online, for example, uh, Euclid, uh, not far off in the future, should be able to bring this down to where we can start testing normal versus inverted ordering. Now, this is the sum of the masses. So if you have normally hierarchical spectrum, you have M1 plus M2 plus M3. M2 is 0 point, oh, 10, 10 milli electron volts, and uh, M3 is 50 milli electron volts. So you get 60 milli electron volts as a sum. If you have inverted hierarchical spectrum, you have uh, 100 milli electron volts. This is kind of the lower values you can possibly have. And then, of course, if uh, the third mass is non negligible, then you will get higher values. So somehow, uh, observations are at, uh, not yet, but will become sensitive to these type of values, 60 to 100 milli electron volts. And so maybe if you have uh, kind of your systematic uh, uh, uncertainties um, uh, sufficiently under control, you could even distinguish between the two hierarchies uh, in this way. Keep in mind that, in some sense, these are model-dependent bounds, because you have assumed one specific cosmology. Right, with cold dark matter, a certain evolution, uh, a certain um, explanation for the dark energy, lam this is lambda CDM, etc., etc. If I start modifying, uh, I could modify uh, these uh, constraints. It's not so easy, but it is possible. Okay, so this is the basics of a kind of neutrinos as hot dark matter. It's interesting that neutrinos can also provide cold dark matter, uh, sorry, uh, warm dark matter. Not these neutrinos specifically, but uh, sterile neutrinos. And uh, I'm mentioning this because for several, uh, for some years, uh, there's been a lot of interest in sterile neutrinos as warm dark matter, uh, cosmologically, because they give you a um, um, power spectrum, so a, a structure in the universe which is intermediate between hot and cold dark matter. So it doesn't have lots of structures at the small scales, while at large scales it behaves like uh, uh, cold dark matter. Uh, and there's a kind of all an area of study there which is very interesting. That's from a cosmological perspective. And from a theoretical perspective, you can explain that with a sterile neutrino in a rather simple manner. And there has been some observations which seem to indicate that that might be possibly the case, but they are very, very, very controversial, and uh, I mean we are far, um, quite far away from a a confirmation of that. Indeed, um, it might just turn out to be um, uh, some experimental artifact that we didn't understand originally. But let's talk about uh, sterile neutrinos as warm dark matter. Okay, so first of all, new uh, S as one dark matter. Uh, um, actually, new four to be precise. So, sterile neutrinos are additional neutral fermions that I add to the theory. Uh, if I don't impose any special symmetry or anything, they will end up mixing with the active neutrinos. So, on one side, I will have the flavor states, including the sterile neutrino. Uh, and on the other, I will have the massive states. Now, this time I have four of them through some mixing. 
Now, what, uh, what technically is a sterile neutrino is the flavor state, but this does not interact with the standard model at all. And what I'm interested in phenomenology and in cosmology as well is uh, the massive state. And this massive state is mainly in the direction of uh, uh, new S and a little bit in the direction of uh, new alpha. Well, more precisely, this is going to be U S4 and this is going to be U S M U alpha 4. So this is nearly 1 and this is a tiny value. But it's through that mixing that this new 4 talks to the rest of the standard model. Right? Because in the charge current Lagrangian, so in my charge current Lagrangian, when I have the term mu alpha bar uh, w mu and L alpha, now, when I express it in those terms, I will end up having also a term of the kind mu4 bar u dagger alpha 4 gamma mu L alpha w mu. And so new 4 can interact with the standard model with the w and the z in the same way via this mixing term here. And when I use a Feynman diagram, I put kind of a little... Uh, cross to indicate that I pick up a mixing. So new 4 can interact with the W and the Z in this way. For instance, um, no, I prefer the Z specifically because what I want to do is make it decay into four neutrinos, four light neutrinos. So indeed, it's not a stable particle because it can decay through this mixing. And so, however, if we go and look at the decay rates, these are really very, very, very tiny. Let me give you the formula, which is here. So the decay rate of this particle will go back. First of all, I have a GF squared. I need to have this mixing, sine square. And then I have a mass to the fifth to compensate. And then specifically, I have another uh, set, six, seven, 668 pi cubed. So now, if I have kV masses and mixing is around 10 to minus 10, this decay rate, the corresponding lifetime, becomes longer than the life of the universe. And therefore, these particles will have not decayed yet. So they can be there, and they can be the dark matter that we observe. So now, how do I look at uh, their production in their linear? So this is their decay. How do I produce them in the universe? Now, remember that in the early universe, before neutrino decoupling, I have lots of interactions in which the neutrinos are involved. For example, let's say, E plus E minus into neutrino neutrino. But now, one of these neutrinos could be a new 4. So I can produce it through one of the interactions in the plasma. What is the mixing which matters? Well, now, is a mixing in matter, really, actually, in the early universe. It's not the, same, the mixing in vacuum, because I have to take into account the effects due to the plasma. Is that OK? And so this will depend on, this will be a function, uh, yes, okay, function of 
the potentials, I call it VT and uh, uh, VD, um, which are due to the thermal plasma. Now, this is the analog of the matter effects we discussed uh, the other day. So these emerge only if I have a background which has a different number of particles versus antiparticles. So for simplicity, for the time being, we neglect it. Now, instead, VT is the one due to the fact that the particles acquire a thermal mass in, the, uh, in a, um, a thermal plasma. And so I have to take that into account. So this is due to the thermal plasma, and this is... Uh, 8 square root of 2 GF, the neutrino momentum, P nu, divided by 3 times mz squared, and then I have the average energy of the neutrino plasma and the number density of the neutrinos plus the same for antineutrinos. <coughs> and uh, similarly, for the charge current part, so this will have a 3mw squared in the denominator and the similar dependence on the densities. What I care about is the dependence on the temperature. This, this will go as a GF, a P nu, and here I have the average energy, which is roughly the temperature, three times the temperature, and the number density, which goes with the temperature cube. So this will go through the temperature to the fourth. So more precisely, my sine square 2 cm, sine square theta m, not 2 theta m, is equal to delta squared of p sine square 2 theta theta is the angle in vacuum, divided by delta square of p sine square 2 theta plus delta of p cos 2 theta minus vd and minus vt, where we neglect for the time being this term, squared, and delta p is the term where we had discussed already matter effects the other day, the delta m square divided by 2p. So notice that at very high temperatures, that t to the 4, and you get another t uh, for the momentum, this term dominates and suppresses the mixing angle. So at very high temperatures, because the mixing angle is very small, you don't produce uh, these sterile neutrinos because the mixing angle is too small. At very low temperatures, but you stop production as well. The moment those interactions don't happen anymore, so below MeV, you again stop production simply because you don't have the interactions to produce these sterile neutrinos. And in fact, it turns out that the, for KV neutrinos, the maximum of production is around a uh, few MeV or 100 MeV, depending on the mass um, of the sterile neutrino. So if I want to compute it a the density a little bit more precisely, what I need to do is to solve the Boltzmann equation. So, So I will have that the change in time of the distribution for these neutrinos, this is the momentum distribution, okay? Remember that you are in the expanding universe, so you will have a term which describes in the, the red shifting, and this is minus h p d over dp f4. This f4 depends on momentum, and time. So this is the change <coughs> of the distribution. And the, on the other side, I have what makes this distribution change, which is the interaction rate. 
So this is the probability to produce one of these sterile neutrinos multiplied by the density of the active neutrinos minus the density of the sterile ones. I assume that we start with a small one, so I'll neglect that for the, um, to start with. So what is this uh, gamma? This gamma nu alpha into nu4 is essentially the interaction rate of the active neutrinos divided by two, and then I have a one half sine square two theta n. Um, so I have the interaction rate multiplied by the probability of producing one of those neutrinos in an interaction, um, and I have averaged over the sine square delta m square blah blah blah, R, which gives me a one half. <coughs> so what is this interaction rate? Gamma alpha. So this is around 1.27 GF squared P nu T to the fourth, oh, I just define it as P, P to the fourth, or 0 0.92 GF squared P T to the fourth. This for nu is and this for nu mu and tau because of the fact that these have also charge current interactions and these don't. And uh, F alpha, remember that this is what I defined uh, early on. Uh, this is just the distribution for a Dirac particle. So I will have E over T plus 1. So you I can actually solve um, analytically this formula, neglecting F4. Uh, uh, My suggest is a kind of a... Is a cute exercise to do. I'll give you a couple of hints on how to do that. You need to use the fact that uh, we are in a radiation dominated area and that the, gives you the relation between temperature and time. So we have that the temperature goes as 1 over the square root of t. And you need to use another fact which is very useful that uh, I want to integrate not in t, but in e over t constant, if I can, because fa depends on e over t. So if I, if I can do the integration in temperature, but at e over t constant, then I can take <coughs> fa out of my integral and simplify the integration very, very much. And in fact, I can do that taking into account that t, dfs over dt at constant energy plus E D over Fs over DE at constant temperature is T D over DFs over DT at constant E over T. And if you see, I can relate this piece to that initial part there. So if I use these conditions, what I'll do, I'll find that minus ht dfs over dt at e over t constant is equal to gamma. Remember that gamma depends on t to the fourth and e sine square theta m, which depends on t in the denominator, and then fa or at alpha, which depends on E over T. And so at the end, I can obtain that Fs is a fraction of Fa given by the integration of the, the part. And I need to integrate, as I said, between the neutrino decoupling and the highest temperature that I have in the universe, which is the reheating temperature. If you find that, as I said, this is an, a nice exercise to carry out, I can find that the density of these sterile neutrinos, h squared, is 0 0.3 for a sine square 2 theta of 10 to the minus 8 
and a mass of sterile neutrinos of 10 keV. So I just want to mention um, that this is the basic uh, mechanism called the Doddleson withdraw mechanism for sterile neutrino production in the early universe. Now I can switch on, for example, this term in the denominator, so an asymmetry uh, in the universe, a lepton asymmetry, because the baryon asymmetry is too small. So if I switch on a, a lepton asymmetry, then I will modify this picture and uh, those predictions, and in particular I will find a spectrum which is colder. So if I plot the distribution as a function of momentum of the resulting sterile neutrinos, this will be shifted at lower momentum. And there are other mechanisms. For example, I can have them produced in the case of uh, much heavier um, uh, scalars. In that case, the distribution can even be colder. Because if it is too hot, so if uh, the average momentum is too high, it will erase too much structure. So you need to keep it relatively cold. There is one way, um, which is to search directly for these sterile neutrinos, but di di directly in a sense, indirectly, really. So if these sterile neutrinos are indeed what makes uh, the dark matter of the universe, then they can decay. Well, the decay into three neutrinos is not very useful because I cannot detect these uh, uh, neutrinos. But it can also decay into neutri light neutrinos and photon at the loop level. So the branching ratio of this is very small, 1%, but it's very easy to detect photons. These are KV photons, so are X-rays. And what is the energy of the photon? Now you have a particle at rest decaying into uh, two relativistic particles, and this means that the energy of the photon is simply the mass of the sterile neutrino divided by two. So what you're looking in X-rays, kind of in your universe, is for a line at exactly half of the mass of the sterile neutrino. Um, and this is where kind of these hints become interesting. So in uh, 2014, several groups reported um, observations of a, a faint peak around 3.5 keV in X-rays. And so this kind of, if this is true, this point towards a sterile neutrino with 7 keV or other explanations also. But this would be indeed the simplest. With the mixing angle, however, that is given by the flux, which is a little bit too low to um, satisfy this relation. So you need to enhance the production or find other ways to produce them, for instance, with a lepton asymmetry. Um, it's a very open uh, area of research. We're waiting for data. So there are new observatories, um, uh, for example, Irosita. These will give us additional information with uh, lower systematics and better energy resolution. And so we will be able to test if indeed there is a line or not uh, in X-rays at 3.5 keV. Uh, of course, uh, this is very, very exciting. It is there. It would be a major result. Okay, so I want now to move to uh, leptogenesis. Okay. And is it okay for today we don't do a break? Because we don't have a, a lot of time, really. So, um, a leptogenesis, I think, is a very important topic. It can explain the baryon asymmetry of the universe, both in terms of satisfying all the conditions and giving the value for the baryon asymmetry. Otherwise, we can also do a quick break and then you allow me to go a little bit over 4 o'clock, as you prefer. <laughs> if, uh, if the chair doesn't complain. <laughs> Whatever, how you prefer. You prefer to continue or to do five minutes break? Continue. We continue. Okay. But it means you, you can I still go over four o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's talk about the baryon asymmetry.
And so do you know that this is the imbalance between baryons and antibaryons and leptons and antileptons for that matter in the early universe. And actually this is the reason why we exist. So, the um, latest Planck results tell us that we have a baryon asymmetry around 8.67 plus minus 0 0.09, 10 to the minus 10. This is normalized over uh, the photon ratio. This, this is the uh, baryon density divided by the photon density. You can normalize it also with respect to entropy. You will find different definitions in different, uh, um, with different, slightly different values. Okay, so how can I explain the baryon asymmetry? Well, either I assume it was there from the start with a tiny number, but you can generate dynamically a baryon asymmetry in the early universe if you satisfy the sucker of conditions. So the basic idea is they have no baryon asymmetry to start with, and then the interactions in the plasma themselves generate this tiny imbalance. So what are the sucker of conditions? First of all, you need baryon or lepton number violation. So, you know that the standard model in the Lagrangian at the perturbative level conserves baryon and lepton number, but at the non-perturbative level, then it violates B plus L. It conserves B minus L. Uh, given the time, I really don't have time to go into that. Uh, but if you want, if you're interested, you can come and see my office. We can talk about uh, uh, spheron effects uh, more in detail. Uh, moreover, but this violation is not sufficient to explain a baryon asymmetry, but many models, uh, extensions of the standard model, do include lepton and baryon number violation. In particular, remember, the CISO mechanism does include a delta L equal to 2 in the Majorana mass of the right-handed neutrinos. So the second condition is C and CP violation. Now, you require to have CP violation because in your plasma you have particles and antiparticles, so whatever you are doing, you want to have an imbalance between uh, what happens in the particle sector and the antiparticle sector, otherwise you don't generate a net asymmetry out of it. And in the case of the CISO, as I will come later, this emerges in terms of delta, um, sorry, of CP violating phases in the Yukawa coupling. And the third condition is out of equilibrium. Because if you are in equilibrium, you can produce a baryon asymmetry, but the same interactions reversely will erase the baryon asymmetry. So in equilibrium, you cannot produce a net baryon asymmetry. But the universe satisfies the out of the equilibrium condition because it expands. So we said earlier, interactions can get out of equilibrium. And at that point, then you can satisfy this condition and generate a baryon asymmetry um, out of it. Now, leptogenesis is particularly appealing because it happens within the context of CISO models. So you explain the origin of neutrino masses, as, but also you can explain the baryon asymmetry. So how do you satisfy the sucker of conditions uh, for leptogenesis? So let's look at the CISO. So we look at a CISO mass model. So from this morning, you remember that we have the NRs. And the NRs have Yukawa interactions 
with the Higgs and uh, the leptons. So these interactions and possibly other interactions, if this uh, is embedded in a broader uh, model, for example, an SO10, will um, bring the NRs in equilibrium in the plasma. So in the early universe, at high temperatures, and ours are in thermal equilibrium. Through these interactions, for example, NR can decay into LH, and LH can produce back an NR, an inverse decay. Remember, you are not in vacuum, right? So this is allowed by kinematics. Okay, so, but when the temperature drops below the mass of, N, uh, of uh, NR, at this point, this interaction cannot happen anymore. The average energy uh, for a thermal plasma is some uh, three times the temperature. So, below the mass of NR, these two particles don't have enough energy to produce back an NR, and NR gets out of equilibrium. And then we'll go on decaying into LH, but NR is a Majorana particle, so can also decay into L bar H star. Uh, notice that we are very high temperatures, and so S2 is not broken yet. Okay, so it can happen, it can decay into both channels, and if there is a CP violation, the decay rate for one channel is different than the conjugated one. And in that case, then I can produce, I will produce more leptons or antileptons, generating a lepton asymmetry. So in this way, I can generate a delta L, lepton asymmetry, and then spheron processes, which are non-perturbative processes of the standard model, convert delta L into delta B. And this is the way I generate a baryon asymmetry. So the quantity which controls uh, this baryon asymmetry is the difference in rate between those two processes, the, the one channel and the conjugated one. So the, the CP asymmetry which is called epsilon I alpha. I is the number of the heavy neutrinos. Usually I deal with three, and so let me take here, usually I take I to be one. And alpha is the channel I'm looking, electron, muon, or tau. So I need to look at the difference in the decay rates of N into LH minus N into the conjugated channel. Normalize over the sum of the rates, okay? And uh, at three level, you don't get any effect because that is in, it depends only on uh, uh, the modulus square of the Yukawa coupling squared. But, so this is the three level process, and I going into LH. But then I have to look at one loop correction, so we'll have an A and I going into LH. Here I can exchange an NJ. 
and here L H. And I have also, this is called the vertex correction, and I will have also the self-energy correction in which I have L H. Here I can exchange an NJ, and I have L H. This is called the self-energy. So I can, uh, now I need to compute the interference terms, which are the one which matter between the one loop and the three level. And I will find the formula for epsilon. In terms of the Yukawa couplings. Okay, so epsilon alpha i alpha is a factor 8 pi in the denominator. Then I have 1 over y dagger y i i. Um, it's clear what y is, is the Yukawa coupling in the C, so Lagrangian that we've written this morning. Okay. And then I have to sum over <laughs> j different from i. So I run NJ in those um, loops, and I will get the imaginary part of Y dagger Y, J I, Y alpha I, Y alpha J star. Multiplied by a loop factor, G, which depends on mj squared divided by mi squared. Where G of x is a function which is defined as such, is the square root of x, 1 over 1 minus x, plus 1 minus 1 plus x and the log of 1 plus x over x. And then I have a similar term which instead depends on mi squared divided by mi squared minus mj squared. So this second term comes on the self-energy. It's important only when the two masses are quasi-degenerate. M1 and M2 are quasi-degenerate. For all the other cases, this first part is the uh, most important one. And if I can um, sum over all flavors, and I'll come to that in a minute. So if I can sum over alpha, the total Asymmetry, which is the sum over the individual asymmetries over each flavor, is 1 over 8 pi, 1 over y dagger y i i, sum for j different than i of the imaginary part of y dagger y squared j i, and then this g function of mj squared divided by mi squared. I'm neglecting the self-energy because I'm assuming that the heavy neutrinos are non-degenerate. When they are degenerate, the name under which this type of leptogenesis goes, which is dominated by the self-energy, is called resonant leptogenesis. So I just want to make a comment about this uh, summing or not summing over um, alpha. So this is the CP asymmetry. But in reality, you have to take into account that this process is not instantaneous. So this, while these decay, the, the tail of the distribution, the thermal distribution of this particle, is still enough energy to produce back the NRs. So there is a little bit of an inverse decay. And what does it do? It erases part of the asymmetry. These are called washout effects, and there are additional washout effects as well. So, uh, 
not all the asymmetry you are producing ends up being a lepton asymmetry. It will be some fraction of that, which depends on how much washout you have. Now, these washout effects can be flavor dependent, so they can be different into the um, uh, electron muon and tau sector, depending if this uh, kind of the, you can distinguish or not these flavors in the universe. That goes under the name of flavored leptogenesis. Um, if uh, it's an important topic, I don't really have uh, time to go into the detail. So, for the kind of for this discussion, we stick to the case in which I can sum. But, um, over the flavors, but indeed uh, is not the case if I go to sufficiently low energy. So if I do leptogenesis below 10 to the 12 GV, I need to take into account flavor effects. So how do we take into account washout effects, which, as I said, are important? What we need to do is to solve the Boltzmann equations for the number density of the heavy neutrinos and the lepton asymmetry. So we'll have a couple of differential equations which are given here. So instead of using the number density, what I use is the number density epsilon y um, defined as the number density normalized over the entropy density. Uh, I, I should use a different symbol. This y has nothing to do with that. So let me call it y like this. <laughs> So, the y and i, so the normalized number density for the neutrino, and I can take the one, the lightest one, over dz. Now, this z has nothing to do with the z we talked about earlier. So now this z is defined as m1 over t. Because this is, when z is equal 1, you have the coupling. So it gives you kind of a good uh, measure of the temperatures. So this is equal to minus d1, y n1, minus y n1 in equilibrium. That is just the equilibrium um, distribution. And then we have the same for the... Um, Asymmetry, so dy delta L over dz is epsilon 1, d1, y n1 minus y n1 equilibrium minus w1 y delta L. Okay, and these D1 and W1 are uh, the washout terms which depend on the interactions I can give you their definitions. So the washout term, so D1 is a factor K1, Z, and then I have the Bessel function of 1, Z, and here I have the Bessel function, well, the modified Bessel function of second kind of order 1 and order 2, so just Bessel function of some kind. And then W1 is one half D1. And then with Y N1 equilibrium Z over Y L equilibrium at Z. This Y L equilibrium. is 15 over 4 pi squared g star and y and 1 equilibrium. Remember that now this become non-relativistic, so it's a bit more complicated. Is a 45 over 2 pi to the fourth g star 
z square and then the modified Bessel function of a second kind order two. And what is this K1? K1 is the term which controls how strong the washout is, so how important these washout effects are. Uh, and it is defined in this way. K1 is gamma N1 divided H at M1. And so this is Y nu Y dagger I I. M1 divided by 8 pi multiplied by 1 over. This H is 2 thirds the square root of G star pi cubed over 5 T squared over M Planck. And G star for the standard model at high temperature is 106.75. Okay, so if you want to solve the leptogenesis equations, you have all the elements uh, which matter. I want to say that if K1 is very large, means that the, the decay rate is very strong compared to the uh, expansion rate. This is called the strong washout regime. Uh, the opposite is the case in which you have weak washout and you have then different solutions for these Boltzmann equations in the two cases. What is important is that once I solve these Boltzmann equations and I take into account that I want also to explain neutrino masses out of it, I still end up with the right lepton asymmetry. So at the end, the baryon asymmetry that I obtain depends on epsilon 1 through a factor, let's say factor washout. This is typically is a factor between 10 to minus 3, 10 to the minus 2. So this is what remains of the total uh, CP asymmetry once you include washout effects. And, then, and so this will give you the lepton asymmetry. And then you have to convert the lepton asymmetry into a baryon asymmetry through a factor which is the Sphaleron uh, effect. This is a factor of order one. And then finally, you have to take into account that there is also a dilution due to the entropy. So, uh, but it is possible to explain a baryon asymmetry around 10 to the minus 10 if I start with an asymmetry in epsilon of around 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7, and this I can do, explain neutrino masses at the same time. Uh, this is, again, one of those areas of research which have become very relevant, especially in terms of linking the low energy CP violation that we observe, or we can observe in experiments, with the one responsible for leptogenesis. This is all area of research. If you're interested, again, we can talk about that um, later on. But I have seven minutes, and that's what I need to discuss sterile neutrinos. So, let me see. First of all, we already defined what sterile neutrinos are uh, in the previous, uh, couple of previous slides. So, we concluded the discussion about neutrinos in the early universe, and instead we move back, as promised, to a little bit of phenomenology to explain sterile neutrino observation hints and what is the current status and what we should expect from there. So first of all, you remember that I already discussed, you have on one, so sterile neutrino, So you have new E, new mu, and new tau, and then you introduce a sterile neutrino, and now you will have a 4x4 four four mixing matrix unitary, and you will have new 1, new 2, new 3, and new 4. New 4 will have a mass M4. And therefore we also give you a delta M square for 1, which is M4 square minus M 
one squared. So if I'm looking at E vistera neutrinos, this is where the hints are, um, I can search for them in short baseline oscillation experiments. So if you remember the formulas that we wrote, the first uh, or the second uh, lecture, we looked at two neutrino approximations of the full formula. You remember, you remember that? So, and we look, we could look at the disappearance, disappearance oscillation probability of a certain flavor, alpha into alpha. Um, and now, if I apply that uh, formula that we um, looked at uh, at that point, mm, So if I assume that delta m squared for one, now, if I have an E V stera neutrino, delta m squared for one will be roughly uh, one E V squared. So much bigger than the other two. And if I go at very short baselines, you remember in the plot they showed that all the different entries for the different experiments and we're looking at the, the last line had very small values for the delta m square L divided by uh, 2e, or 4e actually, um, in the case of short baseline experiments. If I have 800 MeV energy and 500 uh, meters, those terms are very small. So I can neglect delta m squared 3, 1, and delta m squared 2, 1, L divided by 2e terms. So I neglect these ones, and what I get is 1 minus 4 u alpha 4 squared, 1 minus u alpha 4 squared, and then the sine square of delta m squared 4, 1, L divided by 4e. This for the disappearance, and for the appearance, I get nu mu, for example, into nu e, because uh, the one, this is the channel that um, we have observed. This instead will be exactly that, will be um, uh, for u alpha, so u mu for squared, u e4 squared, and then a sine square delta square for 1 L divided by 4 e. Let me check if there's a, yeah, about 4. Okay. So what is the situation? So there are experiments which have pointed towards uh, disappearance. So these are reactor neutrino experiments. So they have looked for, so this is the reactor anomaly. And they have looked for P anti nu e into anti nu e at very short baselines. Okay, and uh, there seem to be uh, some indication of disappearance. Um, of course, to know, to say that you, have a, you are seeing a disappearance, you have to see a disappearance compared to what? So this is normalized to experiments at even shorter baseline. And that is where the difficulties emerge. Um, and uh, normalized to the computation, the theoretical computation of the fluxes. It's a very, very complex problem because you have a lot of uh, components to the neutrino flux. So, uh, but so far, the, the computation of the fluxes seem to point towards this disappearance, which corresponds to a relatively small uh, mixing angle. Um, the latest results, so what is happening right now in this sector is that there are experiments which have been designed uh, to look at uh, these reactor neutrinos at these type of distances, but with multiple, in multiple positions or within the same detector at different distances. In this way, you don't need to normalize it compared to anything. You just look at the difference between um, your two positions. This is, for instance, what the dance experiments are doing in Russia. 
In 2016-17, they were seeing some wiggles in their spectrum. So they were seeing some indications of oscillations as a function of the energy. Now, the latest results they presented last summer at EPS and then um, at other conferences later on don't really see much of a wiggle. So it's very much open. We don't know. There are many other experiments which are testing this stereo prospect, etc., etc. So um, this year, next year, I think we will have some concluding information in uh, this area. Now, we have also indications in appearance, in particular with LSMD and Minimum. And this instead are in appearance. LSMD in particular look for anti-new mu's going into anti-new e's at very low energies, kind of 30 MeV energies and uh, a few tens of meters. And they seem to have seen something. Now, Miniboom was constructed to test this uh, anomaly and came up with its own anomaly. So uh, an excess of events at low energies which could fit within the LSND picture, but maybe not uh, so well. So again, this is again a very open issue. Now, the problem of these data together is the following. So you have also these appearance experiments lo looking at uh, the muon channel. So the third component is uh, the bounds uh, on u mu four square from this appearance. And these are very, very strong. So if I put in a value of UE4 that is allowed or even suggested by the rectal anomaly and the value which is allowed by the very strong constraints I have on U mu4, this number is too small to explain LSND and mini boom. There is a tension between appearance and disappearance experiments. And I leave it at that because we don't know really what is going on. We don't know if there are some experimental artifacts, statistical fluctuations, really sterile neutrinos. We don't know. Okay. Uh, interestingly, uh, the microboon experiment is taking, well, it's already taking data for some time. Uh, they, are, they are analyzing the data at, at some point, maybe this year. Um, or most probably this year, they will present their results. So they look for new mu into a new E appearance, but they, their detector is a liquid argon detector, which is an excellent detector to distinguish different type of events, in particular to distinguish genuine new E events from photons, uh, pi zeros, so neutral current interactions. And so microboom should Set, should tell us a lot about what's happening, in particular the, at the minimum low energy excess. And then there is a program in Fermilab that uses uh, the um, microboon, but two other detectors, Icarus, uh, and a shorter baseline detector, SBND, and they will test completely uh, these, uh, um, uh, these hypotheses here. So we will know, let's say, in two, three years, if indeed sterile neutrinos with these masses and mixing angles are there or not. Uh, of course, the option is that they simply have smaller mixing angles, and so it's more difficult to see them. So that remains an uh, option which is open. But this is very interesting from a um, kind of phenomenological and theoretical perspective. Let me just say to conclude that if we observe sterile neutrinos, this will be a game changer in our understanding of particles, neutrinos, but not only neutrinos. So we'll have to review, you know, the, the models of masses that I wrote early on my board might, might change. The flavor structure might be reconsidered. Cosmology changes a lot because these sterile neutrinos would have been in thermal equilibrium in the early universe. And so you can imagine an EV sterile neutrino contributes a lot to hot dark matter. In fact, it is in tension with cosmology. So if you observe it, then somehow you have to think what went on. Either you didn't produce it, so you need to suppress the production, or you need to get rid of them, or you need to modify the cosmological model. So we don't know. So this is a very important question. So with this, I conclude these lectures. Uh, take away one message from it. Neutrinos are very interesting. The fact that we have seen <laughs> neutrino masses and mixing implies physics beyond the standard model. And so now we have lots of theoretical questions about the origin of these masses, which are in connection with other areas as well. For instance, I talked about collider um, aspect, charge lepton flavor variation, etc. They have consequences in cosmology. I just kind of touched upon last structure formation hot dark matter, but the BBN, 
So very important consequences. They can explain the barrier symmetry. So it's an area of physics which is very, very interesting and kind of is linked to, to many others, both in particle experiments, theory, and uh, cosmology, astroparticle physics. So thank you very much. Thank you.